Hello and welcome to What Would Jane Do? My name is Julia Golding. I'm a passionate Jane Austen fan, but I also have written a series of books about Jane Austen as a young detective meant for children. And I'm joined today by my friend, Katie McFarlane. And Katie, I let you introduce yourself. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kate McFarlane, longtime Jane Austen fan. And in my spare time, I do reenacting with the Regency uh, military group, the 33rd Foot, who happened to represent uh, the military at the time of Jane Austen between 1810 to 1815. Perfect. Now, I am so excited that we Me actually... Too. Yeah, we both are. We have a world exclusive. We have with us as a special guest today, the person who bought that shirt. Yes, I am talking about Mr. Darcy's wet shirt um, from the BBC adaptation of Pride and Prejudice from 1995. I've got my dates right. Yes, you um, have. But in we're going to leave that as a cliffhanger you've got to let us talk about this a bit and hang on to your bonnets because we will be meeting this person uh, very shortly but we thought in order to set the scene we would talk about what would Jane do that's our theme so what would Jane do about Mr Darcy's wet shirt and the first thing that you notice about this is that this whole element of the shirt plugs straight into modern day celebrity culture mm. uh, with Colin Firth adding somewhat to the desirability of that show. <laughs> I'm not sure though Matthew McFadden is great. I'm not sure people would be quite as excited about his shirt. Uh, no, no offense, Matthew. Uh, perhaps we could test that next time it comes up. Yeah. Us. Yeah. Have a shirt off. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> yeah. And that sounds like poor dog. Anyway. Um, so we were thinking that what would Jane do about celebrity culture? And the very first thing I thought, uh, Kate, was that she had a celebrity culture in her own era. Very much so. Mm. And of course, the one that we both immediately thought of was the famous, most probably the beginning of this whole ridiculousness. Yes. Lord Byron himself. Yes. Who, at this period of your uh, regiment, so in 1810 to 1812, he hits the London scene because he's written a series of poems called Chilled Harold, which is a sort of rebel rebellious young man who's sort of um, posing his way around Europe, <laughs> on various things. That's Was my it rather... autobiographical? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's my rather ungenerous um, version of this. Um, but he, he was, I, I think, um, he was both famous and notorious uh, and and uh, you could possibly say, you know, men wanted to be him, women wanted to be with him. He, yeah. he was he was uh, uh, treated, I, I would imagine, like famous boy bands or or pop icons are today. In that it, he was um, not just known within his own circles, but stories about him, songs, poetry, uh, newspaper articles about his exploits were widely spread. And like anybody who's uh, got a whiff of debauchery about him. Um, people would obviously probably take sides and say, you know, don't let your daughters near him. He's a terrible influence. That's good advice. All the, all the young people would be saying, oh, he's so glamorous. He's so pretty. You know, he's so beautiful. Uh, yeah. So it <laughs> did actually, it, it did work itself out into uh, an object culture. Yeah. So uh, there are two that I could think of as well, three actually. So the oh. first thing is him in portraits. So the famous yeah. portrait of Byron wearing the Albanian costume that's the sort yeah. of striped yellow and red golden um, costume. Yeah, and for anyone yeah. who's seen the painting, it's just the height of romance. Here's mm. this dashing, young, virile looking man uh, with a very colorful, exotic costume. And uh, the fashion for Regency at the time was very much influenced by um, exotic travels to if you think of young people going on the grand tour mainly young men they would bring back things exactly like that turkish costume or albanian costume um as as this is you know my my souvenir and look look how exotic i am and how romantic i am and how how cultured i am as well i i can afford to travel and see the cultures of other lands so it was it was very yeah. and all the gothic regency ro romances of the time were usually set in some romantic foreign country just to add some excitement to them. Yes, and um, what then happened um, was that young people would have their portrait painted in this style. And the one that I've seen 
is um, Byron's daughter, Ada Love Lovelace. Lovely. Yeah. Um, her husband, William King, actually has a portrait that's like a kind of less glamorous oh, version of <laughs> the father-in-law. A wannabe. A wannabe, yeah. <laughs> So that happened. The other um, portrait thing about Byron um, was the etching of him with an open neck shirt. Yes. Cravat. The actual Byron would have been shocked about this becoming associated with him because he was quite a snappy dresser and he a mm. gentleman. And But that open necked thing that you then get played out as the image of the romantic poet. Yes. Um, so if any of you have seen the romantics at um, TV series, <laughs> Yes. That's what they're all open neck. Lounging shirt. about in a state of undress, really. And this is Mr. Darcy. Yes, exactly. This is Mr. Darcy. And he's not wearing his cravat when he jumps in the pond. No. Uh, so that is immediately tapping into the, the subliminal message there to us all, as well as sort of the bedroom connotation, was yeah. this is a romantic lead. Yeah. Yes. And absolutely. Then, and in, I mean, you only have to look at, I, I find it amazing how that image um, and, and its. Uh, uh, constant link to romance you only have to look at just about a million uh, romance novels today there's the hero in a shirt slightly untucked slightly disheveled just uh, the white shirt is almost iconic in its own state for for signifying romance isn't it yes on the front of all the covers and all those yeah books. yeah um, it's a cliche but it's a cliche for a reason and then the final um byron associated one well, i'm sorry about this so if if children are listening cover their ears <laughs> Um, there is, yeah, <laughs> with his affair with Caroline Lamb, wow. yes. uh, she would send him intimate clippings of her hair, shall we say, uh, <laughs> as in a sort of wishing to get this back from him. So it's sort of the people taking, you know, locks of hair and things like that of him. And, Changes of bits of themselves, yes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this is almost like a relic now. Yes, it is like um, a relic. So there was definitely that, and the boat, of course, she was a celebrity in her own right. Um, so there's this element of a very hyper celebrity culture around Byron. So I'm going to bowl you a harder one. Is can you think of any other celebrity craziness of this <laughs> era? Um, other celebrity regions. Well, there's there's um, uh, there's so there's people getting pregnant. Uh, the the Queen getting pregnant. Um, uh, uh, there's there's various mistresses and, and things like that that were followed by the um, uh, the court papers. I mean, there was there was celebrity around the the happenings of the Prince Regent. Um, yes. So, so he right. was very much in the press, very much in the cartoons, and the cartoons were like the social media of the day, weren't they? And, and the ballad yeah. singers. Um, so he was never out of the press really with his exploits with women, um, uh, the amount he spent. So again, it was people delight, don't they, in talking about the profligacy of others, but they secretly think, "Oh, what would I do if I had that much money?" And there's there's that sort of, "Oh, the the the, um, the joy in in just imagining somebody having that much money and being able to spend it on whatever you want." And of course, you know, he he created some things that some considered to be a folly, like the the the, the Brighton Pavilion, and other people think are, are marvelous, and magnificent. Um, and so he there's had power to do all that. Yeah. So there's another place I'm thinking of, uh, yeah. which is the theatre. So the person who straddles, forgive the mm. pun, um, is Dora Jordan. Who yes. Is the long term mistress of one of the princes, mm. of family with them, but she's also the most famous comedic actress of the sort of 1790s. Uh, yeah. Era. And you could say the Duchess of Devonshire. Was it was equally yes. very famous, very followed. All her fashions were were looked at, and she was quite a, a political figure as well in who she supported. Her influence, she was probably one of the first influencers that I can think of. Um, uh, and uh, of course, Wellington, his exploits. Um, he was fated in the press and, and seen as a, a, an amazing hero for his exploits. Uh, welcomed at parties, um, women again. Uh, found him very charming and someone to to look at, and of course, um, the the ultimate uh, celebrity was Nelson, who reveled in his celebrity. Uh, went, was again fated everywhere he went, very romantic figure, in, and he wore a lot of bling. Uh, all the awards he's he'd won on his his battle honours, he wore them everywhere. 
he had a quite a scandalous liaison with uh, Emma, Lady Hamilton. Um, uh, so, so loads of fuel for the gossips and for the scandal sheets. So we've got, um, we're sketching out a world where Jane Austen is surrounded by this celebrity culture um, with the Kardashian style Duchess <laughs> of the chair and the, uh, I don't know, the Tom Cruise, who is up Nelson. I mean, you could sort of <laughs> fi find your equivalent, have some fun thinking about that. But um, what would Jane do about it? One of the things we know about her, of course, is that uh, she doesn't put her name to her books. Mm. And one reason that is often put forward for that is, well, it means that uh, women weren't supposed to be out in public making themselves infamous in this mm. way. But maybe, maybe she just didn't want people turning up <laughs> at Fulton <laughs> and knocking, you know, putting their nose to the window like they did to poor old Walter Scott. Yes, because she clearly, she didn't do it for the fame and she did it like most writers because she couldn't not write. Um, yeah. uh, and if, if anyone who's ever, it's one thing to say, I would love to write a book. Um, it's another thing. I think a lot of what I would consider true artists is they do their art whether people notice it or not. It's something that sort of comes out of you and wells out of you and you need to express yourself. And I think who, you know, who better to express themselves and, and the need to express themselves than uh, the women who were basically seen as ornaments in society a lot of the time if they were uh, middle class or upper class I'm not <laughs> the women <laughs> of the lower classes who had to work worked very hard and just as hard as the men uh, but anyone in in uh, an environment where they they were largely told to you know shut up and look pretty a lot of the time and your only value is as an ornament to your husband and that's obviously a, a sweeping generalization but that was the kind of attitude of your value is denoted by your marriageability which a lot of Jane's books are about so it, there must have been a huge need for women to express themselves. And if you think of the ways in which they had to express themselves, um, the arts were pretty much all they had in terms of um, you, would, you would show your creativity and possibly the things you were interested in or passionate about in watercolours, sewing, uh, playing of instruments uh, and writing. And language, as, as we've said before in the Regency period, was very valued playing with language, um, writing long letters to family and friends. So writing was very much um, something anyone who was educated would do. But uh, I think Jane Austen sort of broke through uh, in terms of expressing how she felt, how her social observations. It was much more than just an exercise to entertain herself and her family. It became more than that. She, she entertained the world with her, with her books and her personal observations but it but, was definitely a way to express herself I think we can agree she wasn't after celebrity at all no, not at she all. shows in her books that she understands how it works so let's take Pride and Prejudice I think there are two places we see it mm. one is the arrival of um, Mr Darcy and Mr Bingley <laughs> mm. right at the beginning of the book the whispers in the assembly room everybody talking about them and making assumptions about them, which Absolutely. is obviously the plot driver here. Yeah. Because often what happens with celebrities, people put upon them, they will tell you the basic facts about them and they will make decisions about them. And mm. that will get, in our day, heated up, super heat, super <laughs> on, on social media. But basically the assembly room is that equivalent. The whispers go round and everyone has their opinion. Um so, and in a lesser way, I suppose, the soldiers coming to Meryton uh, was like a boy band descending on uh, your, your local city. You'd, everybody would want to go see them. Everybody would want to be near them. And uh, they they were um, bright, literally, brightly coloured. Um, they, they were young, fit men uh, in a neighbourhood that possibly didn't have many young, fit men. Or if they had them, they were probably of the lower classes. So there weren't that many eligible young men around so there would be much excitement uh amongst everyone really the the army coming to be billeted on your neighborhood or, or nearby was an event and in a, a society where yes you had wars going on let's not forget but they didn't really impinge on your day-to-day -day life um there would not have been a lot of excitement uh, around so something like a huge body of new people to talk to and entertain and interact with would have been a huge event Yes, and just moving from that sort of, you know, Meriton circle, mm. where we feel Mr Darcy 
is not that happy with his celebrity status. The officers are quite happy. <laughs> yes, they obviously but, enjoy it very much. Yeah, but if we take it the other way, where we see how it becomes poisonous to be the celebrity, then you get Lady Catherine de Burr with her acolytes, who's like the most diva-ish of Hollywood <laughs> actors these days, demanding their, you know, spinach smoothies and their green M&Ms or whatever it is their little are. <laughs> And she has she um, makes that as her due. That is her yeah. station in life. I mean, a lot of people um, very high up on the totem pole basically pretty much treated themselves that this is my divine right to be treated this way. You know, I am the, the lord or the lady of all I survey. What is aristocracy if it's not an early form of celebrity? Yes. Discuss. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's I, a whole new podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, and just finally, before we meet our special guests, so everybody, <laughs> we're getting there. I want to final, finally look at this interest in objects that belong to somebody, mm. uh, something that's touched somebody. So, well, I, I, think, I think there was a particularly uh, one that touched me, and I still remember going to an exhibition in Greenwich uh, uh, for the Naval Museum, and they had a marvellous exhibition of parallel lives of Wellington and Napoleon um, and how, you know, eventually culminating in their meeting at Waterloo. And you could see the differences, but also the similarities of what they went through to get to that point. And in the middle of the room, so they, these, they, they had objects and things running down the side of the room uh, on both sides. And then in the middle of the room, they had Nelson's shirt that he had got shot in at Trafalgar. So this was an amazing, iconic um, object still had some very dark, rusty blood stains on it. Somebody had clearly saved that shirt because it was so significant to save for future generations, uh, like they would have saved the, the, the clothing of a saint, possibly. It's got that sort of feel to it. Uh, and just seeing it displayed as, as a historical artifact sent shivers down my spine. I thought, wow, uh, I'm seeing a piece of history here. And they also had the tradition of death masks where they yes. make uh, a, like an imprint of the dead. It's, you know, it's like having a photograph of somebody. It's like, oh, they're about to go. We're going to lose this person. So um, it's a bit mad and too swordsy, but it's... Uh, it's <laughs> it is they, fascinating, though, because you do see the bones of their face mm. and, and the proportions of their face. And, and it's not, it's impossible to um, romanticise it. It, it. It is directly taken from the face. So I'm always fascinated by those, ghoulish though they may seem because it's a true representation of what they look like in their, in their final moments and possibly not, uh, you know, as full figured as they might have been. But, but it is, it's very interesting as a, a truer representation than you normally see of this person. And we also I have the, um, the real things that belong to Jane Austen as well, particularly yes. at the Jane Austen house. So I love her quilt. Yes, the quilt. And the writing desk. I mean, these two are my favorite. that always strikes me about the writing desk is how tiny and how simple it is. Yeah. You know, there's none of the, the airs and graces of somebody writing at a, you know, Queen Victoria type double desk with gilding and lots of drawers. It is literally a desk you might put a glass on. It is so small and so simple. And for me, that sums up um, the Regency period as well. Elegant, functional, beautiful. But I think Jane would tell us, don't get too wrapped up in all of this because she's no. not able to <laughs> parody this. And the one where I'm going to leave before we meet our special guest is uh, Emma and poor old Harriet Smith with her yes. collection of beloved objects <laughs> from Mr. Elton. Uh, the the he... scene is so funny, but it's also kind of full of pathos as well. I have saved these relics of a love that could have been and of someone who was so important to me. And as we know, Mr. Elton didn't think of her at all. So it's all one sided and built up into this fantasy of, of romance. When and, and it's the two different versions. Mr. Alton didn't even notice her particularly, except as a friend of Emma. And and Harriet built uh, futures in the sky with yeah. with a bit of sticking plaster and a stub of pencil. <laughs> yeah, and and of course, I mean, circling back to the present, there are many people out there who have intense relationships on one side with with celebrities, following them on Instagram, and and you know, it, it always amazes me how they think they know them. Uh, because if you think about it, especially with uh, T the advent of television, these celebrities are coming into their rooms on a nightly basis. They're watching the fictional stories unfold. Uh, and if the stories are done very well, as 
as in the 1995 uh, Pride and Prejudice, for example, people get personally invested in it. They want to know, as if they would know about real people, how is it going to end? Why is she running off with that man? What's going to happen next? And they, they, without, although they suspend their disbelief, although they know it's not real, they're in their their sort of most dense emotions. They get involved and they they value these relationships and they really genuinely care about these relationships. And it kind of sucks you in, doesn't it? Um, fictional stories. I mean, stories, whether they're real or fictional, have the power to move us, to make us think what if, to empathise, to sympathise and, and to believe. Right. I think that's a very good um, segue now to talk about <laughs> that so. shirt. Uh, yeah. And so we're going to have, imagine a drum roll, people, because we are now going to meet the man who, I guess a clue, meet the man <laughs> who bought the shirt. And well, it's I, I, I have been watching um, for the last week, uh, there were little drops in the media of, oh, there's going to be an auction. There's going to be an auction from Cosprop, who are auctioning various iconic costumes that they've uh, had for television series and films over the years. And um, I I was fascinated by the fact that the BBC was running something on it. Uh, The Guardian was running on it. And not just UK newspapers. I found articles as far away as New York, Singapore. All of these things were suddenly interested in the fact that, and and they all led with the same costume. There were about 20 costumes they could have led with. They all led with Mr. Darcy's wet shirt. Okay, we can't keep our audience in suspense any longer. So step forward, the man <laughs> who bought Darcy's shirt. Out of the hour. Those of you who are watching this on YouTube are getting a clue because Katie <laughs> Kate has left her seat and into her place comes a very distinguished looking gentleman. Would you please introduce yourself, the man who bought Darcy's shirt? Hello, Julia. I'm Hi, Richard McFarlane. I'm the uh, museum's manager for Colverdale Museums. And I can announce that it was uh, Bankfield Museum in Halifax that has acquired uh, Darcy's shirt from the auction. So for our listeners, listeners from abroad who won't know where Halifax is, would you like to explain which part of England you're from? It's in the north of England in West Yorkshire, um, up in the uh, the Pennines. So uh, the the centre of the country and Yorkshire is the centre of the universe. So um, it's a suitable place for it. So if you've been watching um, Pride and Prejudice, it's not that far from the Peak District, where it's just across the other side of the Pennines, really. From well, somebody there. has measured, apparently it's 35 miles from where it was filmed. Well, one of the fans has measured the distance. I think, so. <laughs> so, Richard, clearly you're not some Colin Firth. Into, well, maybe you are, but I imagine <laughs> as a museum, you're... Um, motive for buying both the shirt but also the yellow police from the uh, Emma with um, which year was that of 2022 I think uh, 20, uh, 2020 the Anya Taylor Joy one yeah. oh sorry 2020 Covid years they've all gone yes yes um, so you bought that as well <laughs> which we if, if I just say the yellow police everyone can think of the poster that went along with that film can you tell me what, why is it you thought that it would be a good idea for your museum to get these modern recreations of older clothes? Well, those, those two particular items, you, you, you mentioned them, and they, they are iconic. Um, and they are now pieces of costume history. Um, Halifax being a textile town, um, and the, you know, the wealth of Yorkshire was built upon textiles uh, over the centuries, Our museum is very much focused on costume and textile um, as one of our specialisms. Um, And we've we've got an increasing uh, uh, following now of people coming to our exhibitions that are based on uh, costume and textile. We've recently, well, a few years ago now, developed the um, uh, the upper floor at Bankfield Museum into a fashion gallery. And every year we're putting on a, a different... Uh, exhibition that's based on fashion, costume, textiles, making, that sort of thing. So the <laughs> costumes that you purchased, were they made with the same materials as they would have originally been made or are they, uh, have they replaced it with? Not, not necessarily. The uh, At the auction, we actually acquired um, seven different costumes uh, because we, we also got a couple from Downton Abbey. Um, 
and a um, the king and queen from uh, the king's speech. And very important to us because we have Shibden Hall is one of our museums, Shibden Hall in Halifax, um, which is uh, the base of Anne Lister um, and the BBC uh, series. There were two series of Gentleman Jack um, uh, covering the story of Anne Lister. We also got one of her costumes. This will add to our collection because the uh, we were uh, very generously gifted a lot of the costume by the BBC production company Lookout Point. Um, so we've, we've got a, a very good collection of costumes from Gentleman Jack now. Now, as, as a museum person, it used to slightly annoy me that um, film and TV costumes seem to get more interest and more following than the real stuff, because we've got a fantastic costume uh, collection and costume designers actually come to our museum uh, to look at that costume collection and then they go away and they, they do some of the costume design. But the, we found that you know, putting on historical costume attracts a certain audience. Putting on film and TV costume attracts a bigger and wider audience. But it's not real. It's all fake. Um, <laughs> well, is it, though? It's, it's a different form of this. So I've just been um, to the Kensington Palace uh, from Crown to Couture exhibition, which was comparing 18th century dressing to the Met Gala. So Billy Porter, Beyonce. And so you could say, well, that's a kind of fake celebrity culture, but it's it's not. These celebrities are, in a way, are the equivalent of the Mr. Darcy's these days. Um, mm -hmm. They So I think you're you're actually following a trend. I think you're right on message. That it's it's a way of getting people interested in the past if you show them a contemporary uh, reference which they relate to. Mm -hmm. And get, going back to those first two, um, particularly Jane Austen related costumes, mm. um, a lot of people growing up they will hear about Jane Austen. Um, some people will read it, but probably a minority these days. I think uh, most people probably come to the works of Jane Austen through TV and film adaptations. Mm. Um, I know certainly the uh, the 1995 one, but a lot of people more interested in it. Um, and yeah, I, I myself um, hadn't read uh, Jane Austen um, until uh, you know, it, it's several years ago now. But it, it was something that I was, I, my interest is in history and in Georgian history. Um, and uh, at the risk of alienating your entire audience, Jane Austen's fiction. Um, <laughs> which I know, which I know is what right is right. Um, but as, as a museum person, my my background interest is more in in the real. Um, but once once I was interested in Jane Austen and interested through those costume dramas and through um, things like the Jane Austen Festival, uh, then I, I actually went to read Jane Austen as um, background research because, of course, her period detail is spot on. Um, because she was living it. Mm. And, and so I was reading it from a different angle. But in doing so, I then myself came to realise the brilliance of her work. Um, and Jane Austen is the second most influential writer in the English language, in my opinion. Um, I'll, I'll give the number one slot to Shakespeare. I think we have to uh, yeah. acknowledge that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, and uh, that is including um, yeah, the great poets, Byron, you were talking about, Wordsworth. Um, the Charles Dickens, um, you, know, you know, any other author that's going, I think the the influence that Jane Austen had on the English language um, and on the, you know, you know, the, the writing of English, um, she is uh, probably the second most influential um, author in, in that language. Um, so it... Mm -hmm. it's you know, sort of looking at uh, things like the, the TV adaptations, it's something, um, the pivotal moment of Pride and Prejudice and the bit that um, uh, yeah, it, it, it shows that breakdown of um, Darcy's very stiff and formal character when he does strip down to his shirt um, and go for a swim. Um, it puts him in a very diff different light and an awkward situation. And then the chance meeting at Pemberley um, with Elizabeth, the embarrassment on both sides of that um, that also it's fairly clear when you read the book that the the point where Elizabeth really falls for Darcy is when she sees his house. Um, 
And and I think Jane Austen was being quite sort of having a bit of a go at Elizabeth uh, on that one. Um, oh no, I disagree. I think she's being totally <laughs> ironic there. That's, that's um, a discussion, but it's yeah. a pivotal moment in the story. Is that thing and. And you could say it's almost when she sort of does start to fall in love with him, um, is that visit to Pemberley, and then realises that um, he's not the person that she originally thought he was. There is obviously no wet shirt in the book. Just want There's to put that out there. No, but the, the wet shirt is now a piece of costume history. And I think that scene, um, they, they did such a, a good job with it that um, not only did Lizzie fall in love with Darcy, but millions of women around the world seem to fall in love with Colin Firth as Darcy. And probably quite a few men too. Let's, uh... <laughs> yes, uh, in, indeed. Um, so, um, Richard, were you surprised by the international reaction to this particular... I mean, if it, it take out the shirt, I don't think it would have got the interest, would it? No, the, all the um, newspaper and uh, international coverage and the media coverage um, around the world, and it has been absolutely worldwide, um, it all talks about the shirt. Um, and it's Mr. Darcy's shirt sells for £20,000. And um, it's all that. It's, it's also that outfit. Um, it, it, it's the whole outfit. It isn't just the shirt. Oh. Out of the outfit. It's the shirt that everybody focuses on. So um, I, I think it would be very reassuring to a lot of people out there who w worried that it might have been bought by somebody with some sort of Colin Fur fetish who was going to hide it away. This is now going to be on public display. Um, is, is it going to be the whole, well, you may not have got as far as thinking about this, but are you going to um, have a mannequin with the whole outfit on? Is that the kind of idea to display it properly? We will display it um, as soon as is practically possible. Um, we, we are a museum, so um, on the good side, uh, that means that uh, we don't need an export ban on it. Um, it's staying in the country. The, um, uh, it will be in public ownership and on public display. Uh, so anybody will be able to come and see it. Bankfield Museum is a free museum, so there won't be any charge. You just, you just need to get to Halifax to see it. The, um, we, we will need to condition check it, catalog it, mark it, do all the things that we do in museums um, because we're like that. Um, but it will also therefore be preserved for the future. So it will be looked after. One thing that might disappoint people is it won't be worn again. <laughs> and it won't be wet. <laughs> and we'll, we will try our best not to get it wet, yes. Um, so when, when we display it, because of the value of it now, it will be sort of protected from those things. So um, yeah, uh, yeah, we will either put it in a case or it will be very carefully invigilated. We will put a link in our show notes um, for people. But if you are thinking of um, touring up in Yorkshire and you want to find out if it's gone on display, it's a very good idea to follow the museum on their social media because I expect they will announce this um, when it's ready to be seen. Yes. And if you're thinking of a t if you're coming from abroad to the UK and you were going to go to what they call Bronte country, uh, you're not that far. <laughs> it's all that same area. So you can easily add it into your literary tour of Great Britain. Um, you probably fit in a trip to Pemberley at the same time. Yeah. Which is, um, in uh, near Stockport uh, in Cheshire. It's not actually in Derbyshire, um, but it, it is about 35 miles away from um, where the museum is. There we go. We've just planned a perfect day for somebody. You go to Howard, <laughs> um, the museum, and then to Pembley. What could be better? Thank you so much, Richard. And uh, it's so exciting to talk to you. And well done for getting that for a museum, because it's so yeah, nice. The other great thing I'd, I'd like to mention is that the, the money has gone to, um, it was Cosprop who put up the sale. Mm. And the money that, um, because a lot of people will be thinking about, oh, what a ridiculous amount of money to spend on a shirt. Um, it will go to uh, the Bright Foundation, um, so it, the, all the money is going to charity, including the, the auctioneer's fees. Um, Kerry Taylor Auctions have, have donated their money to the, uh, the, the charity as well. Oh, so that's the great. continue to do good. Um, Fantastic. Yes. And the Bright Foundation, it's so nice that that yellow police, which is the brightest clothing I could imagine, has gone to support them. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Richard. Am I allowed to have Kate back just so we can finish off our... You session? are, yes. Yes, I'll um, those of you who are watching will work out that they live in the same house. There is a connection between the two. Um, 
So, Kate, I believe we've just been, sitcom, really. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we've been talking to your wonderful husband who also joins you in your um, 33rd foot regiment. What is well, that? If you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> yeah. Isn't he a, a colonel? Is he a colonel? Uh, he's he can he's many things, but mainly a captain. Captain McFarlane. Oh, a captain. His, captain. His McFarlane. Majesty's thirty third foot, looking yeah. very splendid. I'm sure we can. He, so lots, as you can imagine, lots of people on social media learning of this uh, event um, have said to Richard, "Oh, you want to? You'll be wanting to wear that shirt, won't you?" Uh, and Richard, of course, with his museum head on, going, "No." <laughs> and also, I I've said he doesn't need to. He's got a perfectly good one of his own. And we've got a picture we might share with you later of Richard, the last time he hired Mr. Darcy's entire outfit for an exhibition about film and television, wearing his own outfit perfectly well in front of that uh, very that iconic would, outfit. That would be perfect. If you could send that to me, I'll put it as the, on the, on the cover. Uh, Possibly on... one of Richard in his reg regimentals showing just how splendid a soldier I think so. to look. That would be lovely. <laughs> so just to finish off, um, do we have any Jane Austen related news to share? Well, strangely enough, Julia, we do. <laughs> other, than the, other than the shirt. I mean, what could be better than that? Oh, I mean, well, that's, you know, that, that, that is my Mr. Darcy of the week is my yeah. husband, obviously. Um, so so uh, just a, a quick mention um, that Caroline Jane Knight, Jane Austen's great, 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 great niece, um, uh, will, be asked, will be hosting a global celebra celebration of Sanditon on the 14th and 15th of June in Guildford. Um, so we'll, we'll maybe send you a little uh, uh, in, invitation to that. Uh, and also the Jane Austen Festival has started already announcing uh, themes for its festival in September, uh, amongst them uh, a Gothic ball and several days uh, with themes around them for you to dress up with that theme. Uh, there may be some shirts involved, who knows, <laughs> for the men. Because uh, one, one thing I really love to see at the Jane Austen Festival is men. More men. We need more men. It's, women. it's not just for women. Men, get out your glad rags and come along. Too many wallflowers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have some news as well, which is, oh, yes. um, so I've mentioned I write for children, but I also write for adults. So my first adult historical novel is coming out. I cannot it's... wait for this. And yeah. Julia, I, I cannot believe you didn't tell me about this. I had to find out, listeners and viewers, from Amazon that Julia was releasing a Regency murder mystery. For goodness sake, Julia. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Sorry. It just never came up. The <laughs> audience. <laughs> but it's called The Persephone Code. I'll add a link to the... I'm so excited about this. I can't tell you. It's I've coming out. <laughs> it's coming out in uh, America as well as here. And oh, they put it forward a month. So it's coming out actually in April. So very soon. And oh. it's um, all that era we've just been talking about. And I'm channeling all my knowledge of Jane Austen into the background. But the actual yeah. theme of it is about the Hellfire Club. The Hellfire Club was this sort of risque, secret party group. The Byron basically. probably would have attended. Yes, it's very Byronic, <laughs> indeed. That one was going um, to be the Byron. <laughs> yeah, and, and they uh, they used to party in, amongst others, a place called the Hellfire Caves in West Wickham, which is um, west of London. It's a, as it sounds, a series of caves which they used to have their debauchery in, shall we say. Um, and that's one of the areas which I've explored in the book. But it works like a Da Vinci Code novel in that there's puzzles and it takes you from iconic place to iconic place, unpicking a mystery. So um, please do. Uh, I'm going to have a holiday just so I can read this book. Yeah, it's great, <laughs> it's great fun and it's absolutely jam-packed with Regency Easter eggs. Those Thanks. of you who know your Regency period will um, enjoy a lot of the little details. I will enjoy feeling exceedingly smug as I read it. Yeah. <laughs> um, we might be have a chance to do another podcast before I do my book launch because I've decided to do my book launch in the Hellfire Caves. So I'm, there. I'm encouraging I'm everybody to come and <laughs> channel the Hellfire Club vibe without the satanic worship. We'll keep, it. <laughs> we'll keep it just as uh, as fun and, you know, Good, clean fun. Yeah, we, don't, we, we don't want to be arrested, sadly. No, uh, no. Off our podcast, won't it? I think Richard has one final thing to say. Oh, yes, Richard, do come in. Are you allowed to be on screen at the same time? This is this will be a, a challenge for the, uh, the camera. Regarding Mr. Darcy's shirt, it belongs in a museum. <laughs> for those of you who are watching this, you'll see the delightful Raiders of the Lost Ark hat, the Indiana Jones hat. So thank you, Richard. I think well, that is the last word. It belongs in a museum. 
And thank you everyone for listening.